I'm, uh, my district is home to a lot of big technology um, companies as well as a lot of agriculture, a lot of specialty crop agriculture, and we are already seeing some of the merger there. I think one thing that is incredibly important um, for folks to understand is technology isn't kind of its own separate area anymore. It is kind of basic infrastructure, and we need to think of it as basic infrastructure and the types of businesses that are running, but also understand how best to use that. And, um, and as someone who worked in technology for many years, I think as the talk about developing standards is something that we've gone through many times before and hopefully can inform some of the work that all of you are doing to make sure we're doing the right things in, in this area in particular. Um, I think this hearing also shows that privacy is definitely not a issue of any one particular industry. It is an issue that we have um, and is not just a technology issue, it's everyone's issue. Um, just like bulk collection of information um, from an ordinary citizen by a federal agency has been a great concern and something we focused on in um, the other committee I'm on, the Judiciary Committee, so would the collection of precision agriculture data and the release of that data. Um, Dr. Farrell, you talk about a few things in your written testimony as well. We know that for digital information, we don't always have the same standards of protection of digital information that we do of physical information, which is why we've seen some folks more concerned about information going into the cloud or being used digitally. One example you bring up is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, that was a law that was written in 1986. A lot has changed since 1986, especially about the way we communicate electronically, um, yet we still have not updated that law. Um, and so can you tell me a little bit how updates to laws like um, electronic communications privacy and others would have an impact and potentially help folks feel more comfortable with big data and technology and agriculture? Well, and certainly, and, and, and you make a very good point where actually two, number one, things have changed a little bit in information communication since 1986. And number two, people have privacy concerns almost omnidirectionally. Uh, I kind of wonder how Facebook knows what I just searched on Amazon. I thought that seems kind of weird. And so I, this is a concern with respect to agricultural data that is unique to agriculture. But it's indicative of concerns that I think cut across almost all industry sectors and, and, and private individuals as well. And so I think one of the struggles that we face going forward if we want to enhance some of the statutory protections on privacy is, is defining what is agricultural data. Because we could argue that it's unique in that it contains information that is generated by a producer and their activities, their management decisions on the farm, and that's provided to a service provider in the expectation that they're going to receive a direct benefit from that. Um, you can make an analogy to your Amazon purchasing history in that, well, I went to Amazon, I wanted to get these products, and so those products provide a benefit to me, but then Amazon has that information, uses it to make suggested sales, um, in some ways may share that information with other organizations, and then I kind of start to feel a little, bit, a little bit differently about that. So agricultural data has some similarities with that, but also has some uniqueness, and the particular problem that we face is, do we want to do that on an industry-by-industry -industry basis? Or is the better approach to step back a little bit and say, well, what protections do we want to have in place for what we would, might basically call consumer-generated data? Um, that's your Amazon purchasing history. That may include your farm's data. Um, but we could also argue that includes your, your financial reporting data and your credit score, things of that sort. So we really, I think, need to have a, a dialogue about what are the rights of the individual with respect to data generated by their activity, but perhaps collected by a third party, whether that's you know, uh, directly or indirectly. And now, so I, I a, a warrant standard probably for digital data like we have for physical data might also kind of be a good, another place we can start. I would, I would um, definitely agree with that. Um, Dr. Stern, you talked about some of the standards that were being developed and when we talk about security in particular, and also a lot of these standards, they're moving targets, right? We're getting new technologies. Um, what you might think is the most secure infrastructure you could put in place today may change tomorrow. Um, how are you adapting those knowing that this is a dynamic environment and things are going to con be continually changing? Sure. At the Climate Corporation, we have a dedicated team of cybersecurity specialists. And so we are constantly um, looking at industry best practices and new technology. You're exactly right. I mean, this is a very, very rapidly moving area as we talk about digital ag. And of course, the threats associated that could come in uh, around us with respect to data security are evolving rapidly. So I feel like this is going to be just an area that the entire industry 
needs to be vigilant about and continue to um, work on. I think there's space for us to collaborate across industry-wide, competitors or not, to figure out how do we go ahead and safeguard data. And while the OIDA project, which is about how does data get transmitted, which is more about an API type of approach, I do think there's work to do on how do we really work across the industry on uh, data security, because it's, it's, it's evolved daily. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield back, Mr. Chair. I uh, thank the gentlewoman. Now the gentleman from uh, Iowa, Mr. King, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses. And I turn first to Dr. Stern. And I'm over here, Dr. Stern. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this um, first, um, the, the, um, the climate corporation uh, I see San Francisco is on that list. Is that is that part of a Google initiative that's come together with Monsanto? That that's part of this package of, of climate corporation. Um, no, the climate corporation is, if I understand the question, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Monsanto. Yes. And uh, maybe I misunderstood. The was it was it generated within Monsanto or was it? Uh, Oh, okay. No, it was a private company that we purchased uh, two years ago, just about now. And it was started six years earlier and predominantly was developing this technology for the crop insurance business. And uh, we both felt from the Climate Corporation of Monsanto saw how you could use big data and analytics to actually influence a lot more uh, operations on the farm than just insurance. Could you tell us just a little bit about the genesis of Climate Corporation forming, who the brains are behind that? Yeah, sure. So the founders uh, were executives at Google. 10 years ago or so and left uh, uh, David Freeberg, who is the CEO of the company, um, started a company called Weatherbill, which was really focused on, hey, there's a bunch of industries out there that weather impacts their success, golf courses, ski resorts, bike rentals, that type of thing. And so that was the genesis of the business. It evolved into a, a core competency of weather prediction, weather forecasting, weather data. And today, we, we still get 3 million weather feeds a day which feeds into the agronomic model. So that was the origin. And but I appreciate that. That puts that together and links up with uh, the memory that I have of that. And uh, now I want to just try if I can summarize uh, what you can do uh, with climate.